evolution has many constraints. Upon looking at the, the natural world and examining the way things are organized, we see that many of these systems are designed with the evolutionary constraints in mind and develop only according to evolutionary constraints. And this itself is a pretty powerful um, piece of evidence for evolution. It, it's best to think of evolution as a sculptor, not really as an engineer. Although there are dozens of examples of evolution creating new structures, it does best simply modifying what's already there. A wonderful example, example for this are camel toes, and I'm not kidding. Um, as you know, camels have fleshy pads. They've got two toes because they've lost the other ones. You know, they share a common ancestor with all, you know, tetrapods, so they originally had five um, digits, but they lost them, and now they just remain with two fleshy pads. Now, why would this be? Well, it, you need to understand the history of the desert, and that's where the camel lives. The desert wasn't always as such. The camel originally lost the toes to make more of a, a hoof type structure, which would be excellent for running on fertile ground, which is exactly what deserts used to be before they dried up. But since the desert's already dried up, but since the desert's dried up, then what exactly is the camel going to do? Well, it could regrow those lost toes, but again, that, that's difficult, and because they've been um, not being expressed for thousands of years, the genes would likely be subject to mutation because natural selection wouldn't be correcting them. For more information on this, see the last video, which was on natural selection. Um, so regrowing them is, is an unlikely option. Instead, it's best suited to go ahead and modify those two toes into one that's good from running in fertile ground, like a hoof, to one that'd be great to running on sand, somewhat like a snowshoe. So how this would happen is it would take the two remaining toes that it would have, and it would flatten them out and make fleshy pads in between, and support um, webbing, which is exactly what the, the camel has done to make its toes ideal for running on sand, as opposed to on fertile ground like deers and horses. Another fantastic example of an organism evolving under evolutionary constraints can be the supercoracoideus tendon found in birds, which is responsible for the, the upstroke of the wings. Now, think about it from an evolutionary perspective. This organism has to evolve something which will allow the, the wing to upstroke, to get back, and so it's able to repeat the power stroke and fly. Now, there are two ways that it could do this. One is that if you were to... Um, create a brand new tendon, it would have to go from the basically the back, which is where you'd put the muscle, which would be used for, to elevate the upstroke of the wing, onto the wing, and it would just be a straight shot. The other thing, however, and why that's not really feasible for evolution, is because the muscles which are responsible for the upstroke are located on the chest. So instead of being designed from scratch, what the bird has to do is kind of rig what's already there and make its super, super coracoideus tendon insert from the wing all the way going up around the back over the arm, and back and inserting into the chest muscle where it originates. And once again, this is completely not incompetent, but it's not the best way to do things. But that being said, it's the only way that it could have evolved. And, of course, it's exactly what we see. So being able to understand the constraints of evolution and knowing what to look for can be a powerful piece of evidence for evolution as well, in addition to simply understanding it. Another thing to keep in mind when examining how a trait might have evolved is that there are trade-offs for virtually everything. Let's take a cat, for example. Now, cats need to be able to do two things, which are run fast and grasp prey. Well, unfortunately, the structures which would make each of those ideal are oppositely suited. For example, to run fast, you would want smaller um, surface area limbs, for example, like a horse's limb. So you wouldn't want to have these big fluffy paws. However, for grasping prey, you can't really grasp prey very well with a hoof. You need claws. So for a cat to be able to do both things, it has to compromise and meet in the middle. And this is important also. Another thing to understand is that there are embryological constraints for evolution, too. For example, um... Just take a look at the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now this is a nerve that comes off of the brainstem from the vagus nerve. Um, it loops around, goes all the way down from the brain, loops around the arch of the aorta by the heart in the chest cavity, then goes all the way back up to the larynx, which is a several foot detour. And why does this happen? Well, it, it of course the, the much more natural and or the, the obvious thing to do would just have it go from the brainstem to the larynx. But because it develops a certain way, it can't do that. Because this nerve um, originates from the sixth pharyngeal arch, and yes, those are those dreaded gill arches, um, it, it, it migrates. Structures have to migrate out of the head into certain places of the body. And, and due to the differential migration of different things in different arches, it's stuck this way. So it, although it would be ideal to have it simply run from the base of the brain into the larynx, it can't do that. It, it develops a certain way due to its evolutionary history, and it has to adhere to that. Another oddity about evolution is that when a trait is no longer needed, instead of simply scrapping it or throwing it out, evolution finds an alternate use for it. 
A perfect example of this is Megal's cartilage, which started out as a lower main element in primitive first gill arches. But as life evolved, the structure was really no longer needed, so does evolution throw it out? No, instead it finds an alternate use for it. In human beings, instead of supporting gills, it just becomes this phenomandibular ligament. And just this is just one more example, Meckel's cartilage, like virtually every other of the, the thousand components of the human body, you can see them and, and trace their homologs all throughout um, phylogenetic trees and throughout evolutionary history. So the, the evolutionary history of Meckel's cartilage is also extremely interesting, and I'm putting a link to it right here. So definitely be sure to check that out if you have some spare time. The remainder part of this video is going to be relatively new information, and many people typically don't understand this, however, it's a very important aspect of evolution, and it's the answer to when somebody asks you, well, why didn't X evolve this way or that way? It would have been much better. Um, epistasis and pleiotropy, um, which are two new concepts, are, are typically the answer as to why that didn't happen. So to begin with, epistasis is literally one gene being acted on by other genes. It means stepping on. So you've got many genes controlling one trait. For example, if I've got a gene for um, really tan skin, that's fantastic, but if I've also got a gene making me an albino, it's not going to matter. And there are many other examples of this, but that's just one. Um, even more important is pleiotropy, which is where one gene is controlling many traits. And a wonderful example of this could be um, Tyrannosaurus rex arms. So let's say that, you know, you're a dinosaur. Tyrannosaurus rex, any, any dinosaur with very large head size um, or jaw size specifically, would be very well selected for. It could eat more things. But unfortunately for that, the gene which is controlling jaw size is also controlling arm size in an inverse proportion. So to get a really big jaw, you have to have really tiny arms. So you're sacrificing one thing, and that could be just one answer to why T-Rex had the little arms, because it was selecting for the super huge jaws, and it wasn't really using its front arms. Um, another example of this could be um, deer antlers. And there have been a couple... Um, Deers or deer recovered from um, around. They died around the time of the ice age, and they actually plotted them. They did a regression analysis on it in terms of antler size and body weight and survivability. And it turns out that the genes which control antler size also control body weight. Now, if you know anything about um, deer reproduction or anything, the antlers are very important. And individuals with large antlers are extremely desirable and much more likely to pass on their genes. Unfortunately, the gene that's controlling antler size also controls body size. So in order to get large antlers, which are desirable, you're also going to get a ridiculously large body. And if you've got a ridiculously large body, you're not going to be able to... It's going to be much harder to stay alive because you're going to be requiring much more food. So it, there, there's a certain limit. So you could ask, you know, well, why could... Why wouldn't, you know, deer just... Why wouldn't the antlers just grow to, to relative infinity? I mean, they'd be great. You know, females wouldn't stop mating with them. And the answer to that is because of pleiotropy. The body would get too big, and it would just be too much of an energy drain. So next time somebody asks you why a certain trait evolved in a certain way, be sure to keep these concepts in mind, as they're most likely the answer. Um, lastly, I had one quick question. Um, if any of my listeners happen to know anything about um, servals, um, jungle cats, or savanna cats, please let me know, because I'm really interested, and I have a couple questions for you. Um, thanks again, as always, guys. Have a good one.